Hi guys, Ashley here. Today we're with Jeffrey Tosen, who's going to talk about all things digital in China post COVID-19. Jeffrey has his own huge followership on LinkedIn and all other social media platforms. He's a fellow Alibaba influencer. He is also a professor in Peking University and author of multiple books and the creator of a program on China digital, teaching entrepreneurs around the world on how to go about strategy in China and digitalizing their businesses. Jeff, it's phenomenal to have you on the show. Thank you. It's fun to be here. Um, I know that right now, Jeff, you are in Thailand. So tell us very quickly in half a minute, how is everything in Thailand right now? COVID-19. We thought we were going to be fine. We thought this passed us all by. It was China, then it was Europe and the West. Well, it, now it's in Thailand. So we're all shut down. Everything's closed. Curfew <laughs> in effect. Airlines are closed. Borders are closed. But there's worse places to hang out in life than Thailand. It's pretty nice. So, yeah. Absolutely. Like so the beaches, else. the beaches are closed as well, right? That's it. No, no. no. The beaches are open. Yeah. Shopping okay. malls are closed. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. Um, Jeff, you've been living and working and watching China for so many years. Right now, what do you think is essentially the impact of this COVID-19 in general on China economy and digital uh, ecosystems, on the consumers? How will this outbreak impact the life and work in China? I mean, I think we see two effects. We see the first one, which was just businesses, like just just doing business, not the consumers, just business. Mm. Everyone realized that they had to do something because all their staff were at home for the first time. All your students are at home, all the teachers are at home. So there was a big, big push into what in the West we call enterprise, digital enterprise, you know, B2B, mm. SaaS, video conferencing, Zoom, all of the, well, not Zoom in China, but uh, <laughs> so there was just a big adoption there, which is actually kind of cool because China is a bit of a laggard when it comes to the enterprise side of digital. The U.S. and the West is far ahead. China is awesome on the consumer side. The enterprise side, it's a bit slow. So there's a huge adoption by uh, Ding Talk, which is Alibaba's mm. video conferencing, got all your staff on this, that thing. Um, WeChat Work, Huawei has one. So we saw a big jump in just enterprise side of digital. Cool. But now people are back to work. So yep. that, that's great. But now people are back in the office um, and factories, not all the way, but to a large degree. So the other big move was on the consumer side because people realized like no one's coming into my store, right? Nobody's showing up at my shopping mall. Nobody's coming into my restaurant. We're bleeding money. How do we reach our people? And the go-to solution for that, look, if you can't, the whole point of the quarantine economy, they call it, or the stay-at-home economy, is avoiding interactions in person. That's the whole goal. Well, the solution to that is digital interactions. Let's replace our in-person interactions with digital interactions. So there's a big wave of people trying to reach their customers through live streaming, which was mm. a huge thing. Everybody jumped in live streaming. You have a big department store, 200 sales associates. They're all sitting empty, the stores. Nobody's coming in. They all start live streaming. 200 sales associates are doing little video channels. Mm. So th there was a big push into digital on the consumer side. Not a big push. It was already happening. It just accelerated. Mm. And then the, the hanging question is, okay, the supply problem is kind of resolving itself, but are we sure all the people are going to come back into the stores? Even when it's safe, are we sure people are coming back to the nightclub? Mm -hmm. Nightclubs do live streaming, which is funny. Um, cooking shows, chefs, restaurants, they live stream their chefs so you can cook along at home. Are we really sure the consumer behavior is coming all the way back? Mm -hmm. Or is it only coming 80% of the way back? Movie theaters, you know, you can sell your popcorn. If you're a movie theater in China, you can sell your popcorn online through Alibaba. Mm -hmm. So the consumer one maybe is a longer term thing. And maybe we're going to see it different coming out than coming in. But mm -hmm. we don't know. We don't know. When are we going to know? Uh, there was, I've, I've heard a bunch of CEOs talk about this, you know, kind of the big CEOs, the Starbucks, the, the mm -hmm. Anheuser-Busch, the Budweiser. Mm -hmm. and, and, and everyone was talking about you know, probably somewhere around, around June, the recovery will happen where they think their sales are going to come back. 
Now that could change, who knows, but that's what people were saying a couple of weeks ago. Okay, for certain products that makes sense. Are people mm -hmm. gonna keep buying beer? Yes. And you can channel switch. You used mm -hmm. to sell in the bar, in the nightclub, because people buy alcohol, point of sale. You can channel switch and sell that online. Fine. So we can see some of this is likely to come back, but what about, what about movie theaters? What if six months from now, people still aren't going to movie theaters because they're used to watching at home. Mm. I mean, they'll come back somewhat, but what if it's 70%? So certain ones I would expect to bounce back pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Others, I don't know. Mm -hmm. What if you're a local side, you know, little street store selling clothes and people just aren't coming in? What are you mm -hmm. supposed to do? These, these companies have very small margins. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how the consumer picture sort of comes back and who gets burned and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. We'll know probably in uh, C-Trip, the, you know, the big tourism site, their CEO right. just said like they thought tourism would be back in the summer all the way. Well, C-Trip CEO also a couple of days ago was live streaming for the first time in his life and he was live streaming out of Hainan uh, selling a very expensive, well, multitude of packages, traveling packages to Hainan because they did a research among thousands of consumers in China and they figured out that the number one place where people want to travel after everything sort of comes down is domestic, first of all, travel. Secondly, they want to go to Hainan and they also, I believe, want to go to not Kunming, but um, another beautiful province with mountains, actually. So in Hainan, Sanya, he was in 200,000 RMB per night room, and he was showing them what that kind of mansion buys you, what that money buys you. And it was very successful. I think he sold up to 1 million RMB worth of travel packages. So they definitely hope that it's all going to come back, but uh, whether it will and how that will actually happen is another question. Right now we see a lot of, um, let's say, government support, right? So they're giving these digital coupons to consumers to actually start, uh, start purchasing and get this uh, party going. What do you think about the uh, you know, financial stimulus, what can companies do, what can uh, governments do, whether these measures will work. Do you believe that the consumer sentiment in China in general for the rest of 2020, let's say starting from summer, will be strong or is it going to fade out? Are people really scared in your uh, perception? Uh, plus looking at the West when everybody, even Thailand is shutting down, you know, um, what's your personal opinion? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't have a, I mean, there's a lot of factors and I can't, I can't figure it out macro. Like certain, I mean, everyone's getting hit, right? Virtually yeah. everybody's taking a hit. Yeah. You know, a couple companies are selling well, but most people are taking some degree of a hit. And some companies that's difficult, but not critical. Right. Yeah, if, you're, if you're a small hotel that you've borrowed a lot of money and you're 20% occupancy, is there anything anyone's going to do that's going to help you? And if the government says, we're going to give you a tax break, I don't think, you know, some companies, they're not going to make it. I mean, there's just, you know, but if you've saved up your cash and you've got a nice scalable business, like I think Starbucks said that at the high point of coronavirus in China, 80% of their stores were shut down. Yeah. But it's actually kind of easy to, to turn on and turn off a Starbucks. You know, you bring in five people, you turn on the lights, you're good to go. You know, you, you can scale up certain businesses better and they're a big company and they got tons of money. So it's, it's different. I think if you look sector by sector, you can probably say, ah, oh, this, this group looks pretty good. Mm. Like, um, you know, restaurants are doing well. And I would say, I'll make one macro comment. I think across the board, I find that Chinese consumers are pretty conservative in their financial position relative to say American consumers who have a lot of debt mm -hmm. and you know can't there's a decent portion of the population that can't go 30 days without a paycheck you know there's in the not US, as much you mean. in the US yeah. yeah yeah so China I think is historically more conservative less debt save up money own your house outright you know there's a lot more of that so I suspect they're probably in better shape financially mm. uh, now the flip side is the government has a lot of more debt so who knows um, I, I don't know, sector by sector, 
we'll see what happens. Uh, digital's doing great. E-commerce is interesting. Everything entertainment's interesting. When Small you said retailers. When you said everybody is taking a hit, some people out there are also talking about the biggest winners of this whole situation. The biggest acceleration is, as you mentioned, is happening in uh, digital, right? Platforms like Alibaba, um, ecosystems like JD+, Plus, Tencent, ByteDance, all the gaming companies, etc. cetera. Um, do you think they are actually winning or are they being overwhelmed no. by this stress testing of their systems? No, I mean, you can point to certain companies like exercise equipment. People are buying more exercise equipment. Fine, because they're stuck at home. But generally speaking, everyone is living at home. We're just all doing less. Everybody's doing less. We're shopping less. Mm. We're not going out to the club. We're not going to dinner. We're not going to the movie. When we're all, all of our economic activity mm. has just come down and we're all hanging out in our apartments. Mm -hmm. And so the whole thing is down. Mm. But I could probably point to a couple, but generally, even like e-commerce, e-commerce is not going to have like big numbers. They're going to mm. be down. Mm -hmm. you know? So every, it's, we're basically shutting down the economy. Right. So how is anything? It's just down. Um, but yeah, you can point to a couple winners here and there. But no, I would say even e-commerce, I think their numbers are going to be way down. Mm-hmm. And looking beyond, let's say, uh, towards the end of 2020 or 2021, what do you think in general is going to happen post this um, long-term crisis or slowdown um, in terms of Chinese tech giants? Will they have the upper hand still? What is your take on the ecosystems in, uh, on what China is building digitally? compared to the rest of the world. Basically, I, I will also tell you, there are pretty much two lines of thoughts. And one line of thought is that China is going to, through this crisis, through this situation, accelerate it, uh, its development and its domination in all the things, technology and innovation and implementation of that technology, new retail, et cetera, et cetera. And the other line of thought is that um, yes, but it's going to depolarize the world like so much that the rest of the world and China are just going to be so unlike each other and there will be more um, basically resistance toward all things Chinese and essentially it's bad for economy, bad for global economy. What is your take on that? Um, I, I think it's going to be a pivot point. Like mm. the SARS analogy is when SARS happened, Jingdong, JD, was a physical retailer, right? They had, hmm. they had stores. They didn't have any online sales during SARS, prior to SARS. They had a bunch of stores in Beijing. None of their people could come into the store because SARS was going on. This is 2002, 2003. Mm -hmm. So they tried to sell online for the first time. And that's how you got Jingdong. And then they closed their stores a year or two later. Uh, and Alibaba was a B2B player during SARS. And they got a boost in their business because nobody wanted to get on a plane and fly to China and tour a factory. So it's like, mm -hmm. let's try and buy online. So I think you're going to see a lot of sort of forced creativity, forced innovation. We're going to see new business models. Uh, you know, pressure is actually pretty good for you. Like, <laughs> it's uncomfortable, but it's good for you. Constraints are good for you. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of businesses are doing some smart stuff. We're seeing a lot of innovation. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if we're going to accelerate out of this, but mm -hmm. I think we'll look back in three to four years and realize that like there was a real major turning point in digital China because of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it'll probably be positive because the whole trajectory of this thing is positive anyway. So, I mean, it's all going up anyways. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it'll be, I don't know, I don't call it an accelerator. I think it'll be pivotal for a lot of how people think. If nothing else, let's say you're a regular company, you're a, a department store. From now on, if you're a department store, you have to plan in the fact that there is a decent chance that we're going to have to shut down for one month a year. That's possible. Therefore, we need something that replaces in-person interactions, with di with, which is digital. Mm -hmm. So literally every business is going to have to plan in a digital strategy if we all get shut down some random day, uh, and that'll just help the digital world. You'll just see a lot more people coming your way. They'll have to, it'll be in their risk profile. You'll have to have that as an option. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably good for digital as well, but yeah.
I'm, I'm optimistic. I don't buy the whole China US thing very much. I think if you're selling military aircraft, okay, then it's very political. <laughs> If you're doing e-commerce and people are selling smartphones and coasters and fans, is it really that political? I mean, really, you know, I can buy stuff from China here in Thailand all the time. If I go online and I buy a, a fan, it'll come from China. So I think a lot of this is just not political. Mm -hmm. You know, it's food. And right now you mentioned services. a couple of innovative companies. So basically, We've already heard all those examples, virtual nightclubbing and virtual yeah. chefs and, you know, all these new extended business models, let's say. And at the same time, we see a lot of companies, not only this year, but also one, two, three years before, a lot of innovative tech companies uh, in AI, face recognition, um, DGI, you know, all those drones and other stuff also coming out of China. So a lot of innovation is coming out of China. What is your favorite China uh, company that you are watching? And why I'm asking that is because we have Lacking Coffee News that literally yeah. broke out a day ago. Uh, Lacking lost 85% of its stock price in one day after this, um, you know, their essentially manipulation of their, let's call it that, uh, data has been revealed right now. So what is your favorite uh, China company or maybe a couple of China companies? Yeah, the Luckin thing is funny because there is a bit of a history of companies going public in the U.S. and behaving badly. And then you can't do anything because, well, the CSRC, China's security regulatory body, came out this morning. The Luckin news hit last night. Yeah. CSRC made a comment on Twitter this morning that was very strong against Luckin. Oh, like, really? Yeah. Yeah, they're going to... That's... If you're a, a manager who was involved in this and the CRSRC says we're coming, that's bad news. Like, yeah, Well, so. their, their CEO, oh. as far as I know, has not issued any official statements as of yet. So, I know. Look at what the CSRC said this morning. It was, I, I read that. I was like, oh, man. <sighs> yeah. Anyways, uh, favorite companies. I really like, um, who do I like? I actually liked Luckin Coffee a bit because we all got free cups of coffee for a year. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, the private well, their business model was not the smartest, not very sustainable because we got free coffee all the time. I mean, okay, the private investors actually made money, right? Mm. Which is not supposed to happen, but they did. All of the consumers, we all got free coffee for a year. It's just the public investors who got worked. Um, you know, they got left paying the bill for our free coffee. <laughs> Companies I really like, I really like... Um, I think JD actually does a lot of interesting stuff that's smaller. Everyone knows the big stuff, right? Everyone knows the Taobao and the Yoku mm. and Kwai Show and all this. Uh, JD has a lot of smaller initiatives I think are cool. They have like JD Farms where they're, you know, they're giving little digital tools to small farmers that mm. measure the fertilizer need of every bit of crop and giving them guidelines and data standards and then giving them access to a marketplace. I thought that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. They've got, they're, they're fiddling around with this idea of digitizing shopping malls. You know, new retail, we know what that means for supermarkets. We've seen that. We mm -hmm. know what new retail means for like Nike stores. We've seen that, but we don't really know what it means for a shopping center where it's food, entertainment, shopping, hang out with your friends, go with your kids on the weekend. We don't know what it means when you digitize all of that into one sort of digital lifestyle. Mm. So they're playing with this a bit. They have uh, their eSpace, which is a, a new thing they've just launched in Chongqing a couple months ago. It's a big shopping mall that's just digital where you can try everything. That's the thing, you can try everything. Like you can fly the drones in the store. You can ride the scooters in the store. So they're doing a lot of interesting stuff with these business models for convenience store, shopping mall, a place to hang out in your local community where it's like music mm. and, and food and you can order food on the subway. And then when you get off the subway at the subway stop, there's a little wall with chefs behind it and it comes in a little cubicle opens and you take the food out. You order it on the subway as you're getting out of the subway, right? There's a lot of cool stuff like that. That's I think is really neat. I think that's mostly JD I think is, is doing that a little bit more than Alibaba. Mm. I like and the subway just, one. 
Yeah. yeah, you just now mentioned uh, farmers. Indeed, a lot of companies, including JD, Alibaba, or Pinduoduo, you take, you name it, right, are supporting farmers right now uh, to go digital, to start live streaming, to grow their crops better, to manage their whatever chicken farms better. Uh, why do you think is there such a focus of literally every big player in the market on this farmer's economy? I mean, there's two sides to this. There's the consumer side, and then there's the small farmer. What digital tools are good at, I mean, this is Jack Ma's thing. If, when Jack Ma talks about Alibaba, his thing is like, we give digital tools to small and medium enterprises, SMEs, uh, to level the playing field, to let them do the things that big companies can do, but small can't. So Taobao is about, you give a lot of tools to small little merchants and suddenly they can sell everywhere. They can do payments. They can do logistics, just like a big company. That's his mm. thing. Um, well, a big group of small businesses are small farmers, <laughs> little one to two person farms, small plots, no technology, no standards, no data. You give them tools and they can start to measure how much fertilizer they need. And you can put like computer vision to watch all the, chickens or watch all the mm. plants that tell you when one is sick and when this one's ready to pick and not. And I mean, computer vision plus IOT is actually really cool. Mm. And then you give them a lot of uh, data standards. So they suddenly stop being like a family farm that just does things the way they've always done it, <laughs> which is just dump fertilizer on it and then dump antibiotics on it and then hope everything um, doesn't grow. die because right? Because we got to get it to market or we're, we're poor. So you give them standards and measurements and tools, and then you connect them with the consumers. So mm. you give them a route to market. So th it's the same play as Taobao. Mm. Uh, they do real well when they have SMEs on one side and consumers on the other, and then they enable. So small farmers is a good one. Uh, Taobao is a good one. Uh, influencers, individuals who make content, good one. Uh, but if you're connecting consumers with like airline tickets, mm. it's actually not that good because these aren't SMEs. There's 20 big companies. They sell all the tickets. They don't really need Taobao, but mm. little farmers do. So mm. yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff between agriculture. And plus people forget that China is like a, a massive agriculture country. You know, mm -hmm. half, half the world's pigs live in China, like 500 million pigs live in China. That's about half of the world's pigs. And they get disease, right? They mm. get, it's hard to know, you know, how to raise them. Well, you can put cameras on that can see every pig and do facial recognition pig per pig and can tell you which one is sick, which one's not getting enough food, which one's about to give birth. The cameras can do all that. I wonder which company does it because uh, FaceTime, uh, not FaceTime, uh, Face++ Plus Plus is a phenomenal company that does a lot of uh, facial recognition. I wonder whether they also do it for pigs. Which one is yeah, pregnant? They, which one is unhappy today? <laughs> they do all of that because what you normally do is you, you just put all the pigs or chickens or whatever in a big, huge pen. You throw in the food. But if one of them gets sick, mm. what do you, well, you can spot the sick one now, right? The cameras can see every pig. Or, I mean, sickness is not the biggest. I mean, a lot of it's just fertilizer usage and all of that. So the whole system's becoming smart. Mm. And that's, that's pretty great. Yeah, facial recognition, people give it a bad rep because it, it does some bad stuff. It's very good for agriculture, mm. um, poultry. It's very good for pandemics, too. Mm. Well, as we, as we just now learned, right, it can be very, very effective. Absolutely. Jeff, you wrote a book, One Hour China, a couple of years ago, and it sold, I do not know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of copies. It's a very, very popular book. Um, if you, I know that you gave advice to people that are living outside of China, how to understand the major principles and concepts of China in just one hour. If you would give us a couple of tips, what do you think people need to know right now in 2020, April, about China in less than an hour, let's call it two minute China. What would be your absolutely must know and must act on for those that are not yet uh, very familiar with this market? Yeah, I, I look at the big economic phenomenon that aren't going anywhere. Hmm. Politics comes and goes, that all changes all that. Certain things aren't gonna change. Like one thing you can bet on is the rise of Chinese consumers and the rise of Asia's middle class. 
Hmm. That's just a major trend. It's going like crazy. It's going to go for 20 years, 50 years. This is just going to the same way you can kind of assume American consumers are going to buy a lot of stuff. Right. China and the middle class of China and Asia. You, you can bet on that long term. They're still going to need food. They're still going to take trips. They're still going to go on vacation. They're still going to buy smartphones and cars. That's not going anywhere. Now, the competition side may change, but the, the demand is not going. So I, I think you can bet the farm on that. I have. Um, that's why my little my online course is called Jeff's Asia Tech Class. And we just look at mm. technology, digital across Asia, which is China, increasingly Southeast Asia. That's all one big story. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, yeah, you got to pay attention to that. The other stuff might change a little bit more. Manufacturing could rise and fall. Um, capital can rise and fall, but sort of Asia consumers. And then I would say Asia digital, Asia tech. Mm. Those two trends are just, you know, that's going to be the story of our lives. One and of when you talk about Asia tech, do you mean Asia implementing technology and digitalizing all uh, aspects of their life? Or do you mean, apart from that, innovation coming out of Asia? What do you mean by Asia tech? It's, it's both. If you're a hotel in Europe, Chinese consumers, let's say not a hotel, let's say you're a luxury brand out of mm. Paris or Milan. 50, 40% of your market is going to be Chinese consumers globally. Yeah. And more than that in terms of growth. Okay, well, Chinese consumers, they live on their smartphones. You, the, you don't, you're not going to put up billboards. The only way you're going to reach them is social media, influencer, KOL. That is the game. So if you're a European luxury brand, you better understand digital China and digital Asia. You just have to. If you're a hotel in Thailand, you have to understand this stuff. You have to offer Alipay. You have to offer WeChat. So this is not just like a China game. If you're selling mm. avocados out of Mexico, you have to know how to market to Chinese consumers. So, you know, the consumer part is going global. But then I also think that the innovation side, retail, e-commerce, digital marketing, influencers, it's all better in China, Asia now. Mm -hmm. I mean, the U.S. is ridiculous. I mean, it's, I'm an American, so I'll make fun of the U.S. It's ridiculous how pathetic it is. Like, social media, But Amazon, Facebook Amazon and, trying a lot of things. What do you think about Amazon as we are on this topic? <laughs> they're good. They're, they're what, three to four years behind Alibaba? Mm. And, it's, and it's, it's getting worse, right? Like maybe three years ago, you would say Alibaba and Amazon are similar. I don't think they're similar anymore. I think, Am I think Alibaba's way out front now. Mm. Uh, I think retail is pulling away in China, Asia. I think social media, digital market, and let's yeah. see, social media is pulling away. WhatsApp versus WeChat, I mean, it's a joke, right? So communication pulling away. Certain, now, to be fair, if you look on the B2B side, the stuff in the West is better by far. But on the consumer side, I mean, digital China, Asia, it's just getting better and better. Um, and it's happening really fast. So, yeah, I think that's about normal. The interesting thing is in, in Thailand and the rest of Asia, it looks like they're copying um, China. It doesn't look like yeah. they're copying Amazon. It doesn't look like they're copying Facebook. Um, and one of the places this is actually colliding, which is a fun story, is in cloud services. Because we now see three major cloud services out of the US, right? AWS, Azure, and uh, mm. Google Cloud. And then out of China, we see Aliyu and Baidu. And, and they're about the same size now. And they're colliding in Asia. Like not in China, we know who's going to win in China, we know who's going to win in the US. <laughs> but in Southeast Asia, you're seeing both players go head to head. So AWS is versus Aliyun in Southeast Asia. So we're seeing the big players uh, collide. Competing. In certain yeah, it's yeah. pretty cool. I think Aliyun's going to crush AWS in, in Asia. I do. I uh, think. I totally. Just, I okay. I totally see a very similar trend and not only when it comes to cloud services, but in general, when you, uh, when we talk about mobile phones, right? Some markets, you see huge competition coming out again, the West plus China. And when we talk about the West, uh, let me also say there's Korea, Japan, et cetera, brands. It depends on, again, on the market segment. So this kind of Westernized um, it, it brands and then Chinese brands competing shoulder to shoulder when it comes to, um, 
cloud. I remember two years ago how Hong Kong literally suddenly from one day to the next, half of the taxis in Hong Kong were dressed in that advertising of Tencent Cloud and Ali Cloud. And then a week later, everybody was advertising Amazon Cloud, et cetera, et cetera. It was really, really interesting um, how that progresses. And we're talking about Hong Kong only. And right now, it feels that everybody's trying to capture Southeast Asia. Probably the next step is going to be Latin America. And maybe the next step is yep. going to be Africa as well, because this is 70, 80% of global consumers in the next 20 years, right? So these are the big markets to capture. Well, if you look at like smartphones, because that happened pretty decisively. If you go back to 2010, 80% of global smartphones were Western, Nokia, Samsung, Apple. Mm. You look today, it's 80 to 90% Chinese. It's Xiaomi and <laughs> Huawei. And, and no, the Huawei phones are better. If you look at a new high-end <laughs> Huawei versus a new iPhone, the Huawei one's much nicer. Now, the ecosystem's not as good because Apple's got its thing. But, and if, so if you go to somewhere like India or Latin America or Mexico City, it is just Xiaomi and Oppo and Vivo everywhere. Yeah. And so, because most people don't care. Like if you interview people, is this smartphone, let's say you're in Mexico City or whatever, or India, is this smartphone Chinese or American? People don't know. They don't care. They really don't. And it works in China too. If you go to China and you say, this is L'Oreal, who owns L'Oreal? Half the people have no idea who owns L'Oreal. Is it Chinese or Western? I'm like, I don't know. Really? Most people don't. Yeah, most <laughs> I mean, business people, we care about this. Most people don't care and they don't know. So if it's a good smartphone in India, they're going to buy it. So you feel it's all about the product. It's about the quality of the product rather than of, about the country of origin. Yeah, if you're selling telecommunications gear to Vodafone in the U, where, okay, then obviously that stuff is discussed. If you're selling smartphones in New Delhi, people don't care. Not really. <laughs> Some people do, but not very many. That's wonderful. Jeff, thank you so much for spending this time with us. A lot of insights. Guys, please follow Jeff on LinkedIn, Instagram. Uh, there's Twitter, there's tons of other accounts, and Jeff has a website with a course which is called Jeff's Asia's Tech Class. Tell us how to find that course. Right, this is my, I'm moving all my teaching that I've been doing for 10 years or so online, and it's sort of a podcast and daily email, and we're starting to train executives around the world in how to think about digital strategy, how to think about these companies, Alibaba, Tencent, all of them. And it's, uh, it's going great. And that's at jeffhausen.com. And there's a 30-day free trial. So it's free to sign up and try it out and see if it's good. Definitely check it out. 30-day free trial. Well, right now we're all stuck at home. You can definitely consume a lot more information on a daily basis. Jeff, thank you so much again. It was awesome. And guys, stay tuned for more China experts talking about the new normal coming up.